Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of Falcon 2024 here in Las Vegas. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, alongside my co-host, co-analyst, co-founder of theCUBE, Dave Vellante. Dave, it's, it's we're sort of a, a post-lunch lull, but not here. Oh no, we're going to start rocking. We right, are, right? indeed. We've got, we've got a really cool guest next. We have Adam Myers. He is the SVP Counter Adversary Operations here at CrowdStrike. Thank you so much for coming on theCUBE, Adam. Of course, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Good to see you again, man. Yeah, you too. It is a really cool job title. Tell our viewers a little bit about what you do, what, what your day-to-day -day is, is like at CrowdStrike. Um, so it's a combination of two missions. So uh, we combined our intelligence, our threat intelligence mission where we track today 248 adversaries across the globe and catalog everything that they do, the tools they use, how they operate, and really try to bring awareness for our customers to better defend themselves against those threats. And last year, we added the Threat Hunting Mission, which is our Overwatch product team. And that's really about going out into customer data and finding bad stuff. And we've been finding some really interesting bad stuff that we're going to be talking about here at Falcon. Indeed we are. Well, I remember last year, you basically told me that dwell time is irrelevant now. Right, because I think it was 79 minutes was yeah. the breakout time. And breakout time meaning the time it takes to start traversing, right, horizontally. Move laterally, yeah. Yeah, move laterally. And so, and, and that was at Falcon last year in September. By the end of the year, I think that was down. 62, 62. minutes. 62. Yeah. And then, and then the, the record, if I can use that terminology, at the time last year was seven minutes, but that went down to two minutes. Yeah. So you're just seeing, um, Again, as George always says, speed matters. It absolutely matters, and what's really kind of interesting about those numbers too, and I love when I talk to customers and talk to so many customers here at Falcon already, and I say, the adversary got 22 minutes faster. Did you? Can you detect it 22 minutes faster? And that kind of usually is when they start to say, oh boy, I need, to, I need to start thinking about this. How do I even quantify that? So can you detect it 22 minutes faster? We have gotten very fast. Um, uh, one of the things that we are covering here at Falcon is famous Chalima, which is, uh, you may have read about this. This is the, um, what they call remote IT workers. Department of Justice has been talking about this. And uh, I won't let too many cats out of the bag here, but I can tell you, um, we had a customer that on a Monday hired one of these North Korean remote IT workers. By Saturday, the laptop that they were being issued was shipped to a laptop farm where it was going to be plugged in. It was plugged in on Saturday. Within an hour, the Overwatch team notified the customer and they were able to terminate the, uh, the employee, if you'll call it an employee. Uh, they were able to uh, terminate the insider uh, before they even got onboarded. So we actually stopped a malicious insider from being onboarded in that case. So we have gotten pretty fast at stopping these yeah, threats. Yeah, stop the breach, nice, good job. Um, and, real, and, and with groups like world Scattered world. Spider, they, you know, minutes uh, count, we, you know, and we're able to get, uh, you know, well under, uh, you know, within I think it was like 45 minutes of them registering a domain to target one of our customers, we had a notification to that customer, so. So let's, let's induce some more anxiety in our viewers and talk a little <laughs> bit about this threat hunting report and, and some of the, your biggest findings and, and give, us, give us an overview of what you found. Sure, I, I think you know, probably the one that sticks out for me as most interesting is that we uh, took the MITRE attack uh, matrix and we looked at uh, the most common techniques that were used over the last year. And out of the top 10, five of them were identity based, which is threat actors have moved away from using malicious documents that drop some sort of malware, and now they're going after credentials because they know if they come in with a compromised but legitimate credential, they've moved off the X. And now they can continue to operate without being detected, back to a dwell time comment, right? So they're, they're able to operate as a legitimate user who's just logged in maybe from a different location, and that has really been a, a problem for organizations to start to get in front of. So, um, identity attacks have been probably the biggest issue I think we, we've covered in that last threat hunting report. And we continue to see that cross-domain threat hunting is absolutely essential because when the threat actor wants to stay off the EDR, right, they, they don't want to get caught by the security camera, so they come in with a legitimate credential and then they go around it. They go into the cloud control plane 
or they go someplace to like a hypervisor that's unmanaged so that they can avoid detection for longer and inflict more damage or steal more data. And that has been uh, one of the big functions of that report was to kind of showcase the fact that cross-domain threat hunting is not a nice to have, it's a need to have. And those credentials are still predominantly stolen through phishing, Adam, or, or Phishing, other social engineering. Um, we've gotten, you know, with help desks get metriced on how quickly they can turn around an incident, and is there a second callback or a third callback? So the, they're almost incentivized to help the threat actor gain access to the system because they, they don't want to have that second callback or they don't want to have a long time for that call. And so, you know, social engineering has been on the rise. Um, and also a big thing is uh, info stealers. So a lot of folks are working from home and they're working on the same computer that maybe they've got a teenager or, or a small child on. And if anybody has kids that are into Minecraft or something like that, they know these kids will download whatever plugin they want or add-on they want, and oftentimes that comes with a type of malware called an info stealer. And then they log into their work account, and that username and password gets siphoned off and it goes into the underground. So there's another mechanism there. And one of the things in the report was hands-on keyboard breaches. Yeah. That was kind of, to me it was a relatively new thing, up 55% year over year. Explain that a little bit, if you yeah, will. Yeah, so we've traditionally called this kind of, uh, it's been like malware-free intrusions or interactive intrusions, but what we wanted to do is kind of showcase that we're tracking human threat actors, and if you want to track a human threat actor and stop a human threat actor, you need human threat hunters behind the keyboard to do that. And that interactive intrusion really speaks to there's a human on the other side that's typing in commands or doing something interactive with that system, and that's what you need to be looking for. So in terms of what you were just describing with the identity and the cross-domain, the, these, 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 these threats that businesses need to be aware of, particularly at a time where we are seeing more remote workers, distributed teams, how, how are you, how do you recommend and how do you work with customers in terms of making sure that these are visible, these are top of mind? Well, the, this is where products like NextGen SIM become really important because the Falcon data, the endpoint data, is a critical component to protecting your enterprise. But as you start to bring in the identity pro protection data and you start to bring in your cloud data from your um, control plane and you start to bring in VPN concentrator logs, that's where NextGen SIM infused with intelligence and powered by threat hunting becomes a really critical capability. So next-gen SIM means more data sources and machine intelligence in, in, interacting embedded, you know, ground up, not bolted on. Can you explain more what's the difference between, because a lot of people tell me, I just, I would love to get rid of my SIM, but I have to keep it for compliance reasons. But next-gen SIM sounds like something I want to keep. Can you explain the difference? Well, they probably want to get rid of that SIM because it's slow yeah. and it's a beast to manage. So next-gen SIM, you see a lot of things moving into the cloud from a SIM perspective because you can do things faster. You don't have to deal with replacing hard drives and incrementing hard drives. All of that kind of comes from the elasticity inside the cloud. So next-gen SIM is, is really about having that SaaS power and also the ability to index that data and get it much faster. Because if you've ever gone into a SIM and had to find something and you're waiting you know, three, 15, 30 minutes for that query to return, it can be frustrating, you're doing context switches, you get pulled to a different direction and you forget you even ran that query and where you were. So the faster that you can go find that data, go hunt for that data, the better off you're going to be. Give the mouse a cookie. Yeah, <laughs> for those of kids. I, I remember that, that storybook <laughs> well. So who are the most active e-crime adversaries and what, what are their motivations? Scattered Spider still has been very effective. Who names these two, by the way? Uh, the team names <laughs> these. So, um, you know, it, it depends. Sometimes there's an existing name uh, that, that we'll use. Sometimes they come up with something completely new. Um, and that's kind of where they get to have a little bit of fun, right, yeah. as they're reverse engineering they're also... and going through mounds and reams of data. Now they get to actually have their creative part of their brain Choosing turn animal on. personas. Yeah, right. Right. Exactly. Yeah, very cool. Um, but yeah, so Scattered Spider has been extremely effective. They have been targeting every type of industry vertical they can. 
Um, we're seeing threat actors constantly change and get replaced, so as one malware gets disrupted by law enforcement or the government, another one will pop up. Uh, so Punk Spider is one that we're talking about quite a bit here, and it was featured in the report just for the speed at which they're able to operate. And then, you know, we're also still seeing data extortion attacks where ransomware isn't always the goal. If they could steal sensitive data from an exposed cloud bucket or um, they could get in and steal something of value and get out, then they could just extort their victim using that information as well. So there's, um, there's a lot of uh, evolution that occurs from, from that. How are adversaries using Gen AI? We talk, we talk a lot about better phishing emails, we, we see those better texts, so that's kind of, kind of clear. Uh, how, how else are they using it in novel ways? That's a great question. And you know, we've seen some adversaries starting to experiment with Gen AI, uh, particularly LLMs, where they'll use that to, for example, Scattered Spider, we've seen use LLMs to script, uh, write scripts to get access to Entra ID and things like that. Uh, we've seen Indrik Spider, which is another threat actor that does ransomware, using it to facilitate research. Uh, you know, you use things like Perplexity or, or ChatGPT or something like that. And they're using these things as well to facilitate faster research. What we're not seeing is adversaries building their own AI and LLMs. That's something a lot of people have kind of raised uh, awareness or, or concerns about. And when you think about the financial aspect of how much resources a ChatGPT or OpenAI has to put into training a model, I think ChatGPT 4 was like $100 million or something like that. No threat actor is going to invest in that. What they're going to do is they're going to try to gain access to a legitimate commercial model and use that. Uh, where I think we might see a little bit more of it is in the disinformation, misinformation. We're, we're heading into an election cycle. Um, you know, this year has already seen a lot of Gen AI being used in elections across the globe. Something like 55% of the earth was, uh, was electing new leadership this year. And so as um, they've leveraged that to create deep fakes, um, and Gen AI isn't just large language models, right? It's also um, being able to have uh, voices, right? Like from this discussion we've had here for a few minutes, you can model all three of our voices and make us say anything you want. And that's also Gen AI. Uh, deep it's Taylor fake. Swift endorsing Donald Trump. I mean, right? It was the fake Did Taylor she not Swift. Do? No. <laughs> <laughs> he hates Tom Taylor Swift. No, but 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 that was one of the things. It was a he. There was a fake Taylor Swift. Well, doing, there was, uh, doing there just was that. J Joe Biden as well. There was uh, robocalls right, that exactly. were you know for trying to use Joe Biden's voice and. So these things are, are the reality that we live in and disinformation, misinformation is being augmented with uh, these technologies. But they could also be used for good. And that's where things like Charlotte AI, which is something that CrowdStrike has, where you know, we produce on the Intel team 3,000 pages of finished intelligence per month on average. And that's a lot of data. If you try to read all 3,000 pages, that's pretty much your entire day. So having an LLM that could enable, like, like Charlotte, that can enable you to ask questions of that data without having to read all of that information lets you kind of focus on fixing that one problem. But you have to be careful because LLMs do hallucinate. And that's another area of concern where um, you need to make sure that you have humans that are in the loop still, that understand what questions they're asking and, and can kind of see when the answer doesn't make sense. Well, the good generally outweighs the bad. You see that with big tech. You know, what Google has done is a lot more good on the, the positive side of the ledger, but the bad gets amplified, and you know, the politicians like to, to point that out. Uh, and of course, with the elections, we've seen just, you know, 2012 was a little kind of fun with social media. 2016, you started to see weaponization. 2020, it was like nothing we'd ever seen, and now with deep fakes. And there are technologies, right, to be able to combat that. Uh, I don't know how widespread they are. Maybe it's they're in startup mode, but you, well, you would know. If you talk to any teacher uh, in, in K through 12 and, and college, they'll probably tell you that that type of technology to find when students are using these things to generate their own uh, content is really important. But I think the other thing that's really worth noting is that as you look forward a couple of years down the road or maybe even faster, 
organizations are going to have their own models. They're going to have their own Gen AI. And that's where some of the things that we're talking about here, we talked about a partnership with NVIDIA, um, being able to secure your AI workload. Right? Just, just a few years ago, we just introduced the concept of cloud workloads. And now we're talking about AI workloads where organizations are going to have their own AI model running in some sort of a container environment. And if somebody tries to escape that and get access to the container or to the base OS, you're going to have a real problem. So you need to be thinking about those AI workloads and then also data, um, data poisoning attacks and what goes into training those models. Um, you know, does, uh, how do you keep the cheese from falling off your pizza? And the answer comes back, put Elmer's glue in it, and then you have to go and figure out where that came from, and it was you know, some Reddit post from 2014 or something. So you know, that is, that's a whole other angle of, of attack that never you know, didn't exist before two years ago, really. So as we wrap up, you're a cybersecurity veteran. You've been in this industry a long time. I want to put you in a reflective mood to talk a little bit about this moment in time where the world is so much more exceedingly complex and, and, and there's so much more uncertainty. You, you really need to embrace ambiguity. And it's just hard. I'm sure your job is a lot harder than it's ever been. But sometimes when your job is harder, it's actually more fun. Uh -huh. So uh, just talk a little bit about this moment in time and what it means to be, to, to be the counter-adversary of operations, the SVP of counter-adversary operations. It's, it's, it's a really good question. I think we're at a point in time where I see kind of the evolution of everything hockey sticking. You know, it's, it's getting faster by the day and speed, as you said earlier, is what, what matters in this game, and you have to outpace the adversary, and you have to do so in a way that allows you to you know, think about where they're going next, but also be in front of where they are today. Uh, I always like the, uh, the old hockey analogy of don't skate to where the puck is, skate to where it's going, and that's what we're doing uh, across the industry and certainly here at CrowdStrike, and why it is such an exciting time to be doing this, because you know, we added something like 30 new threat actors in the last 18 months, right? And, and they're not just new criminal actors, but entire new nations uh, that we've added that we're tracking. So um, as the adversaries evolve and find new creative ways to get in, we find new creative ways to stop them, and that's the fun. Excellent, well, great note to end on. Adam, always a pleasure having you on theCUBE. Thank having you me. so much. Good to see you again. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of Falcon 2024. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.